Okay, so we have um, this uh, assignment one um, prep exercise, the haunted house. And I know I had some teasers about ghosts and things in Slack. Um, and it's because we are going to find out what the most haunted house is in our fictional little town here. Um, I will paste this because, let's see, I actually can make it a little larger, maybe easier for everybody to read. I'll close that for a second. Um, all right, can everybody read that pretty cl clearly? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll start to read the first uh, uh, section and then the rest will kind of speak for itself. Halloween is approaching and you want to do it up big for the local kids this year. There are four houses in town that have reputations for being haunted and you've decided to take an analytical approach to help you choose which one to rent for the big night. Here's what you know about each house. House number one, Netherfield Manor, has two broken windows, three creaky floorboards, 41 spider webs, a creepy basement, and a normal attic. House number two, the Stillwell Farm, has four broken windows, eight creaky floorboards, 23 spider webs, a creepy basement, and a spooky attic. And we go on from there. Um, house three and house four both have unique properties with different numbers of things. And so you, um, the last piece is uh, how many credible ghost sightings there have been. You're gonna do a poll of the neighbors and determine how many of those um, at, have been at each house. And you're also going to validate and make sure the user's input is between five and 15 sightings. Um, that's just to keep our, our scoring mechanism within reason um, for the sake of the exercise. And then you're gonna rate how haunted they are. You're gonna have the following criteria, three points for each broken window, two points for each creaky floorboard, one point for each spider web, 25 points for a creepy basement, 25 points for a spooky attic, and 10 points for every alleged ghost sighting. After you've determined which house is the most haunted, you'll print the results to the console. Uh, see the file logformat.txt on the left to view how you should format the info. So if you go over here, um, on REPLA, you can see you've got this menu, you know, different things that you can kind of look at. This is usually open um, when you go in anyway. So here's the second file we're talking about, just a text file. And this is the invitation that you're going to be sending out through the console. Um, and you want to make sure it's formatted just uh, like below. Um, and let me make that a little bit wider so that it doesn't cut off. Mm. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's got four paragraphs. Well, actually it's got a header, right? You're invited to the scariest haunted house in town. And then it's got four, uh, four paragraphs, that's it. And you'll notice that, you know, the name of the farm that is the spookiest has been inserted here with its specific information. Um, and then uh, this section right here talks about all the different features, right? And it talks about including a harrowing ordeal in the creepy basement and um, a terrifying trip to the dark and dusty attic. Both of those phrases are optional and it's gonna completely depend on whether those things were true or false for the house, okay? So part of printing this thing out, you're actually gonna have to put a little bit of code in there to decide whether those strings get added to the larger printout or not. Um, and we'll get there when we get there, but I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up about that. Okay, so we know uh, we've got our information on our houses here. We're gonna get a little bit more information. And then we have a point system, a rating system. And at the very end, um, we can use all of that to make a determination and print out that um, invitation. Everybody with me so far? Yep, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so the very first thing that we need to do here is to um, set up some arrays to store the values for the names and the criteria of each house. Each array should have four elements that correspond directly to the four houses. So I actually will skip down to here. This pattern you see, um, you're gonna have your criterion, whether it's you know the number of spider webs or, um, you know, the, what else we got, uh, broken windows uh, or, or whatever. And then there'll be four values from house one to house four um, for that particular criterion. You're just gonna have a whole bunch of arrays like that. Um, the last array will be for the ghost sightings, which is data we haven't collected yet, but we want to initialize that variable. It's actually kind of important. 
So um, who can tell me how to, um, how to set up um, a variable in JavaScript? Uh, first, you have to declare it. So let, we'll let you do that. And then um, the name of the array that we would want to do would be the next thing. So. Okay, so um, for uh, broken windows, um, we could just call that broken windows, right? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, let's do that. Um, that's a pretty descriptive name. Mm -hmm. And um, then. Uh, oops, yeah. Then what, what, what would we do with that? Um, the values or the elements that we want to put into the array, we would surround them with brackets and then each value um, or element would be separated by a comma. So okay, perfect. Yeah. So what, what, what are the values that we're getting here from our information? I guess it would be the broken windows, right? So for like the first element or house one, it would be two. Mm -hmm. And then Stillwell Farm House number two, sorry, uh, would be four. And then three would be three, four would be six. Okay. So yeah, look, look at that one more time so I can remember. It's what is it? Two, four, two, three, four and three, and six. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So you said brackets and then mm -hmm. two comma four comma three comma six. That's exactly correct. And we'll end with a semicolon there. Yeah. So we have just declared our first array and it has, get rid of extra space. Um, it has all four values uh, in order for houses one, two, three, and four. Okay, so we need to do that for, um, for all of these, right? So let's uh, just do that real quick. And let's see, so we got creaky floorboards up next. Looks like we have three, eight, 17, and five. <laughs> three, eight, 17, five, okay. There we go. Um, all right. All right, now we're on the spider webs. Looks like we have 23, 31, 19. Oh, I, you know what? Back up. I wasn't on house number one. 41, 23, 31, and 19. Okay. My goodness, there we go. <laughs> okay, so we said 41, 23, 31, and 19. All right, and then we go back up and check our data again. Looks like we're working with um, this one. Houses one and two have a creepy basement and houses three and four have normal basements. Okay, so how would we represent this? Um, you know, we, we, what we have here is a binary choice. It's either going to be creepy or not, right? So what values would we want to put in for this? What's the best way to handle it? Probably make them Boolean values. Yep. If it's That's creepy, we can say true. And if it's normal, we can say false. That's exactly right. So true, true, false, false. Since the first two were creepy and the last ones were not. And then similarly, we'll do that, um, that for the attics. So it looks like we've got spooky, spooky. Oh, no, I, I'm doing it again, guys. Okay, there we go, normal. Didn't go all the way up. Normal, spooky, spooky, and normal. So we, that would make it false, true, true, false, right? All right. We are well on our way. Um, oh, you know what? You know what we didn't do. This is kind of important. We actually need to put all of the names in because we're going to need those for the um, invitation at the end, right? So we need to get all these names, and I know they're very silly. First one's obviously a shout out to Jane Austen. <laughs> all right, Netherfield uh, Manor. Stillwell Farm. So, it's a, so we're going to do this the same way. Um, we'll just call it houses. 
And, um, but what, what's the, you know, we've had numbers and we've had uh, Booleans. This is gonna be different. What's the data type we're using here? String. Strings. String. Yeah. So we've got some good examples of um, different data types all stored in arrays that all, you know, are, relate to one another um, based on the position in the array, the, the index in the array. Um, okay, I think Zachary Park and, uh, and oh, was it a state? I don't remember what I, what I called it. Paul, Human Hall, and in, in, in that case, we actually do want to take that off. Okay. All right, perfect. So we got our first six arrays. So <clears throat> what about this last one? Um, as I mentioned up here, you know, this last array, you don't have data for it yet because you haven't collected it, but you still need to initialize it. So what would be the best way to do that in you know, planning ahead for needing to collect uh, information for an array? Declare it with an empty value. Perfect, yes, we want to have an empty array, that's right. Okay, so we're going to call it um, ghost sightings. We call it alleged ghost sightings, but we'll go with a shorter version. Okay, and it'll just be that empty array. And we're just going to hold that there. And so when we go to collect the values, we, we now have somewhere to put it, right? Okay. So the first thing to do then is to go get the rest of the data because we can't move on, you know, calculating um, our scores until we have all the data we need. So let's do that next. All right, um, next instruction says, get input from your user to find out the number of ghost sightings at each house and keep it between five and 15. Okay, so who can tell me um, how we uh, ask a user for input? What do we need in order to do that? Read line sync. Yes, we need the read line sync library. That's correct. So um, how do we do that? How do we get it? Constant uh, uh, input equal to equals require read line uh, open parenthesis mm -hmm. and uh, quotations and uh, read line sync, read line hyphen sync. Perfect. Okay. So once you do that, you only have to do this once. Um, we make it a constant because we want to make sure that uh, this cannot be set equal to any other value after this. So we will always be able to use input to ask our questions from now on. Um, you can use it as many times as we need. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we need to ask uh, for, let's see. All right, we're gonna we're gonna have a little uh, mini uh, mini loop here. I think um, the way we're gonna handle this. This was one of the changes I made, guys. Um, <laughs> this part's brand new. Okay, uh, let's do this. Um, we want to ask about the ghost sightings for each house, right? So, do we want to, you know, ask four different times with these four houses? Yeah, what's a better way to do that? A for loop? Yes, a for loop, exactly. Okay, so if we set ourselves up a little bit of a for loop here, we'll be able to cycle through each one of those and um, get, get the response from the user and, uh, and store it. Okay, so uh, what's the proper syntax for setting up a for loop? Somebody walk me through it. For open parenthesis. Mm -hmm. I equals zero. Uh, let I equals zero. And uh, I is less than I is greater than or equal to. Uh, it's not. It's not greater than. You were actually on the right track the first time. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. This takes you getting used to. Yeah. So what you have to keep in mind with the second part is that you're basically telling it, here you've told it where to start. And this is um, telling it 
how long to keep going and when to stop. So as long as I is what? Less than. Yeah, less than what in this case? Five. Well, um, it's not five and the re uh, somebody tell me why it's why it's not five because this, this is um, th something tricky that you have to get used to. Less than five, it becomes four. Yeah, um, the reason <clears throat> for that is uh, why would we only why would we actually stop at three instead of four? Because uh, index start at zero. Yeah, because of the zero indexing, right? So we've got four items, but they're actually indexed zero, one, two, and three. Um, so we we want to make sure to stop just short of um, of four in order to account for that first one actually being zero. Um, and th this is something that pretty soon you guys will not even think about anymore. It'll become natural, but I know right now um, you have to really, really think about it sometimes. Okay, there's a third piece here. We've told it where to start, told it where to end. Um, now, what do we tell it? I plus plus. Yeah, oops, <laughs> lowercase i, right? Yeah, and um, I plus plus uh, is the shortest way to do it. It's the most common way to do it here. What does that actually mean? What is that shorthand for? Plus one. Yeah, and so, yeah. so it's basically saying we're gonna take I, the value of I we had last time and we're gonna add one to it. So you're updating the value of I. Um, and every this, this tells it to increment by one. And if for some reason you were looping through something and you actually needed to just do every you know second one or every third one, then you would actually have to do it out the, you know the, the long way um, and do like you know I equals I plus two or I plus three. In this case, it's just equal to that. Um, you also will sometimes see it I uh, plus equals, right? Um, those are both uh, two ways that uh, other ways that you'll see this done. Um, but for this, this is super short, it's perfect. Okay, so what's the last thing we need on this line to finish our, um, to finish our, our loop syntax? Curvy bracket. Yeah. All right, and I just realized it was gonna push this down. So I'm gonna move this up here. Um, yeah, and you always want to um, push it down so that the final bracket is lined up with that four. Um, so it, it tells you that all of the code um, that you're gonna have inside is gonna start here indented. Um, and I actually have my settings, by the way, I have my settings set to where my indent type is tabs and my indent size is four. I find that a lot more readable than the default they have of two spaces. Everything seem, can get a little crammed when you start nesting things. So the, the you know now that you're writing longer programs, um, if you find that you're getting lost sometimes and having a hard time keeping track of your indenting, this is something you can come in here and change at any time. Okay, so uh, so this is good. So we we've got ourselves um, a loop. So how are we going to ask for the question? Ask for the question. Ask for the answer. How are we going to ask the question? Let's go with that. Input that question. Okay. And let's see. What type the question into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I I think that um, here, you know, what we're really getting it uh, at is is to say. And I tell you what I'm going to do here already. I'm going to use a template literal. So I'm going to use back ticks instead of quote marks so that we can use a variable here. Um, what is the, uh, you know, how, let's do how many. How many uh, ghosts have been spotted at, and then we'll do, we'll just kind of hold that there for a second. Um, and, then I'm going to actually um, put an escape character slash n to force 
um, the, cur the, the entry point to be on the next line in, in the console. It'll look a little nicer. Um, otherwise, sometimes people will just put a space so that you know the answer doesn't butt up right against the question mark. Um, okay, one thing about this though, if we ask this question, um, right now we, we've kind of doing it a little bit like console log. Console log and input that question are very similar um, because they both print something to the console, right? But the difference is that input.question also gives the user a chance to respond and then returns a value. And when that value comes back, you have to do something with it, right? So we have a couple of choices here about how we can do that. What would be one of the choices for, um, for making sure that uh, we capture that value? Perhaps we could store it by uh, using like let and then naming it and then sure. yeah we can we can create a variable to hold it um, temporarily that's that's a great idea it'll help make things real nice and clear okay so let's just call it um, sightings it's not important um, as long as it's you know clear what it is because we're only using it temporarily to get it into our array right um, Okay, and it's also, I know, um, I believe Chetna said last lecture that she was gonna talk about variable scope another time, um, but she mentioned how there are global and local variables. This, this variable citing, because it's inside the for loop, that means it's only available inside the for loop. It's not available out here. Um, whereas everything that we created out here is global. So it's available to anything that we want in our program now. Um, and with that in mind, um, we actually need to be able to access this array, right? Ghost sightings in order to save this. So how do we do that? Um, how do we get this new value we've collected from the user and put it into that array? Push, uh, push statement. Right, good. And so what's the um, syntax for that? How would I do it? Um. Ghost sightings uh, and named dot push dot push. Okay. And parenthesis equals uh, um, push uh, the all the other are the arrays names. Well, um, what is it that we're trying to save, right? Sighting. Yeah, yeah. We we just want to take sightings. So um, one by one, we're gonna go through and for each of these houses and we're going to grab what we just got from them and put it into the array so that by the time we're done looping through four times, we'll have four values in here, right? Oh. Um, okay, so we're gonna do that. So the last thing we need to do here is to make sure that on each loop, we're actually asking for the right house name. So what can we do right here to make sure that we are um, getting exactly what we want there. Add the index. Um, yeah, we can, we can use the index. Okay. So what's, I, I mentioned before, we're using a template literal here, right? So what's the right syntax for putting that variable name in there? Dollar sign. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, curvy bracket. Good. And the, I don't know. <laughs> the index would be zero. Um, the index, well, the first time around, yes, it would. Um, what's the most important thing that we have to add so it knows where to look, though? I mean, where Did to you go put the, to... the name, the, yeah. like the Netherfield the Manor? Well, um, yeah. oh, houses. There you go. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, when this is new, I know it's a little hard to wrap your head around this. You're right. And then and then you're right. We use the index. What's the uh what's the syntax for that? I can't move your picture up there. What did you say? Okay, so then it's going to be the hard bracket. Yeah, I guess it's what you call it, straight bracket, 
and then the index would go within that, which would be zero. Right. So if we, if we wanted to ask um, for the first um, for for index zero every single time we loop through, we can put zero here. But what if we want okay. it to change every time? Leave it blank. Nope. Uh I, I, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is the value of the loop. Um, you know, this isn't just for telling it, I want you to loop this many times. It's actually a variable, um, which is, you know, why we have to declare it like that um, because you can use it and you're using it to actually say, every time you go around, I want you to work with a different data from this array, right? Um, so that, that simple uh, bracket notation there with the array um, becomes a powerful thing because now every time we loop through, it's gonna look at a different one. Um, you know, the first time it'll be this one, the second time it'll be this one and so on. Okay, so we uh, have our question and we are, um, you know, setting it here to push. So here's, here's let's do this. Um, I'm gonna add this, this is just temporary, um, but I'm gonna add, a console log for ghost sightings. Now this is for the whole array, right? Um, this is the array that we created um, up here. If I was to console log this array right here on line 58, what would I get? Nothing. Yeah, you just get that empty array. It would just look like that, right? Um, but if I do it down here right after the loop, what do I expect to see? The names of the houses? Not the names. What what uh, what information did we put? Um, did we just say that we were putting in this? The input, how many ghosts were spotted at the right? Yeah, we've been pushing the, the number of sightings that we collected, right? So that's what we would expect is that now we're gonna have um, it's gonna look a lot like one of these, right? Where it's gonna have four values in it that have been, you know, put in. So so, you know, I know it's hard sometimes to picture this stuff until we actually do it. So let's do that. Um, let's give this a run. Stalling, reline sync. Okay, here we go. First time around, how many ghosts have been spotted at Netherfield Manor? Okay, so let's, we said, we said we have to do five to 15. We have not set that validation up yet, but we'll just stick to it for now. So let's say for this one, we go with 11. And now you notice we have a new name on the second loop around. And uh, let's go with eight. Uh-oh, it's hanging up on me. There we go. <laughs> um, we'll go with 14. And let's go with uh, six. How's that? Okay. And there it is. That's our temporary log just to kind of make sure that the data is what we think it is. This is a good technique to use as you're coding. Um, because if you have several pieces, like we're going to have um, different stages of the program, you want to make sure that, you know, the thing that you're depending on later down the road is actually what you think it is. So throwing in some extra console logs like this is a, is a good way to do that. Um, and we have our four values. So we know that the user input is working, the loop is working, all of that is going well. So let's go back to... Um, the code. The last piece of this is um, we said that we wanted to make sure that it's going to be between five and 15. Um, what is the brand new mechanism that you learned about in order to do that? If statement. Um, you will you will definitely need to use a conditional, yeah, because you have to ch check to see if it's in the right value. Um, what's the what what's going to be outside of the if statement in order to uh, keep asking the user until they get it right? A while loop. Yes, a while loop. Exactly. Now, here's the part where you have to think about the logic a little bit. All right, I'm gonna push that out. Um, where do I want to put that while loop? What is the place that makes the most sense for it to go, you think? Maybe right below line 67 after we ask the question. Yes, that's exactly right. 
it can be a common um, mistake when you're first learning about how all these uh, mechanisms work, you know, for loops and while loops and all that, um, to sometimes think that you would put it down here and just handle it as a separate thing, right? But the problem with that is that if you were to put it down here, um, you'd already be completely done with your loop and it wouldn't have anything to do with checking this question right when you ask it. So that's exactly right. We've asked it once. Now we wanna check and see if what they gave us is um, what we are looking for. And, and if it wasn't, we'll, at, we'll um, ask again. And that's where that, um, that if else condition is gonna come in. Um, it's very important. Okay, so what's the syntax for a while loop? And then uh, after you type while, you'll put in a conditional in parentheses. Okay. All right. And we'll want our conditional to be um, hmm. So we want it to be, I guess, outside of the range that we're looking for because we want to prompt them again if right. they ask if they put in a number less than five or greater than 15. So um, while I guess it'd be like sightings is less than five mm -hmm. or uh, the two straight down bars, yeah. Sightings greater than 15. Yeah, that's, that's exactly good. right. Okay, and then what finishes it off uh, syntax wise? Curvy bracket. Yeah, yeah. The structure of it is just like a for loop, um, except that instead of giving it a lot of really specific, you know, information about exactly how many loops to do, you're giving it something to keep checking to decide if it's true or false. And if um, if either of these, since we used those, um, you know, that or operator, if either of these comes back as true, it's going to keep asking. Um, but if they both come back false, it'll keep go, it'll skip past it and keep going to the rest of your code. Um, what was I going to say about that? Uh, oh yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I for my entire life, I never knew what these were called. They're actually called pipes. Um, these these very tall characters here. Um, and I've, I've been trying to incorporate that into my vocabulary ever since I learned. Um, okay, so here is where. Um, the conditional comes up. So we're going to ask, um, you know, if something and we don't really need an else with a while loop. Um, we really only just need to handle uh, the, the instance that um, hold on. You know what? I'm tripping guys. Sorry. Okay. Tricky thing about a while loop a while loop is a conditional of, a, of sorts because it keeps checking um, the statement just like an if, if uh, block does. It'll check to see if something's true or false and then decide whether that decides whether it executes what's between the brackets, right? So this is actually all we need. Um, and Sorry, uh, sorry that I got, got a little confused on that. Okay, so, um, so all we need to do here is just store something in that same variable um, and, and try again, right? So we can kind of just, you know, can't quite get to the whole thing. There we go. Oops, but we don't need let again because we already, you only use let once with any uh, variable name. So we're just gonna say, let's try that again and try to store something in sightings uh, different. And, you know, we can ask the exact same question, but I don't, to the user, it's actually more helpful if you kind of tell them why. Um, I, I filled out a form online a couple days ago and it was a very long form and it kept just kind of like refreshing the page and then like not going forward but there were zero messages on the page telling me like what field was a problem. Uh, you know, did I leave something blank or was it formatted? Any and I finally figured it out it was because my browser had auto filled a phone number without the hyphens and they wanted the hyphens, but they didn't tell me that. So it took me forever to figure it out. So good user experience um, planning ahead for that is to uh, try to give them the information that's gonna help them move forward as quickly as possible. 
Um, so we could actually just start here and then just add on to the string and say, you know, um, please enter a number from five to 15. Um, and you could eat, you could be even more specific if you wanted to say, you know, uh, no less than five or, you know, no greater than 15. We'll stick with this for now. It's fine. Um, so that way, uh, this part will keep asking until this condition, um, both of these conditions up here, return false, and then it'll move forward and we will have the, the one we um, want stored in that variable and then we can go ahead and push it. Does that make sense to everybody? We can, let's test it out. All right, let's try to run this thing. Okay, so how many ghosts? Uh, I'm just gonna throw some numbers in here. Um, okay, so I've, I've done two that were perfectly acceptable. So you noticed it moved on um, to the third house, right? What if now I accidentally put in 17? Um, it asks again, with the, the same name of the house, but now we get our message, please enter a number from five to 15. And so now we can say, oh, okay, whoops, my bad. And then, you know, put in a four and, oh man, I really am getting this wrong. <laughs> and, then, and then put in a nine and then it moves on. Okay, so um, this is working exactly the way we want it to. It kept asking us until we got it right. And then it moved on to the fourth house. Is everybody clear on that? You got any questions? No questions? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so perfect. So we've got this part down. We've got our, our information. Now we can move forward and start um, getting uh, our actual ratings um, calculated, right? And we're gonna to need to refer back to this right here. Um, so let's just take a look at this again. The broken windows, creaky floorboards and spider webs um, basically just have a you know, flat number of points for every single one, right? Um, so that's just a simple multiplication um, problem, right? And we really can just handle that all together. But, you know, and, and then we're going to have to go and, you know, check for the creepy basement, check for the spooky attic and see if those add in. And then, um, of course, we'll handle that part too. So let's go um, take a look and think this through. Uh, the thing about, you know, preparing to um, do a block of code in a loop that needs to be um, run over and over again is that sometimes, like we talked before, you need global variables that can be accessed from outside that loop so that you'll still have access to them after the loop is over. So we need to think about what those are gonna be. Um, what are we trying to do with this loop, right? Ask yourself um, what it is we're trying to do. The whole point of this is, it says right here, to tally up the points and save the totals. That tells you exactly what you need right there. Um, so typically when we are tallying something up, what do we start with? Zero. Yeah, yeah, we just want some, some variable that's gonna start at zero, right? So maybe we just call it points, keep it simple, right? And we will initialize it to zero. Um, and then uh, the second part, we're gonna save the totals. And let's see, it says right here specifically, store the final amounts for each house in an array. So what do we need for that? We need to declare an array. Yeah, exactly. We just need a, a, a new array. Um, and just like before, it's gonna be empty and we're gonna be putting things in it, right? Um, because we'll be collecting them after we calculate it on, on each loop. <clears throat> so, all right. Uh, so we've got, we've got those and now we're gonna do the loop. So um, first we need to set up the loop. We said before that we can do that in three parts by um, creating an iterator, I making it less than 
um, four, we know that. Um, just out of curiosity, let's say that I didn't know how many houses there were. I just knew that I needed to go through for each house. What might I do instead of hard coding a number here? Uh, you can houses. use the, oh, oh it's, it's fine. Uh, you can use the length um, property, I guess. Yeah, yeah what, what would I take the length of? Um, the houses, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, we know we could take it of any of these, right? Because Not really, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Because they all have four. And that's actually the whole point of doing this the way we're doing it. We'll find that out in a second. So, yeah, if we wanted to do that, we could just do, you know, houses that length. And that way, in case in the future we ended up, um, you know, uh, having five houses or 10 houses, you know, we could, uh, this would be able to handle it. Um, we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to come in here and manually look for that and change that code if that ever changed in the future. Okay, and then our increment. So um, I actually wanna put this down here because I wanna keep all of these inside the loop. Oh, sorry guys, okay. <laughs> Getting my indenting off because of my notes. Right, so the for loop is actually at the base here. Um, and so we're gonna you know, keep that in alignment and then everything inside is what's indented. And yeah, my notes threw me off, sorry about that. Okay, so now we're inside the loop. First thing is to um, make sure we start at zero before adding the points. Now, we already have points set to zero. So why would I say that here? Think about it this way. On the very first loop, when i is equal to zero, we're gonna to go to all of the values um, at index zero and all of those arrays for another field, right? And um, when we get to the end, we'll have points and we're gonna store those points um, on the current house in each loop. So that this variable we've created out here, points, um, actually now is what? It's not zero, right? So if you do that, if you have a variable that's actually global, then what you have to do here is set it equal to zero again, because for future loops, it has to start at zero every single time, right? Okay, so let's do that. And we're just gonna um, set it back to zero. Okay. Um, and then we are going to uh, start um, adding to the points based on multiplication. So um, by that, I just mean those first three, three that we looked at, right? So three points, four broken windows, two points for creaky floorboards, and one point for spider webs. How would we do that all in one line? And also keep in mind that in order to go get um, these values that we're looking for, we're going to need to access these arrays, right? Broken windows, creaky floorboards, and spider webs. Somebody want to give me a uh, give me a guess as to how we're going to do this? We know we're going to start with. Is it input dot? Uh, a question that we ask. No, at this point we are we're we're done getting um, user input from the uh, from the console because we already had all of this data um, set, and the only thing we needed to get was the ghost sightings, and we just took care of that here. Okay. Yeah. So, as you remember, when we when we logged it, we saw that the data was there, right? So yeah. So now we have all the data, and it's all in these arrays, and we need to go get it. And right now we're concentrating on these three right here. So do we use the variables and the arithmetic operators? Yes, yeah, okay. And, and um, so we, we need to start with points, right? Because the whole point of this is to add to um, the points to keep, uh, keep tallying things up, right? And the most common way to do that is to use that shorthand plus equals so that we don't have to say points equals points plus. Um, but it means the same thing. So we're going to start adding to the points. What uh, we know, we know that we've got, um, you know, 
the broken windows array. And we also know that, sorry, I'm losing my, my information. Here we go. We also know we want three points for each broken window. So what would we do with that? So it would be three mm -hmm. asterisks. Mm -hmm. Oops, <laughs> there we go. And will we do it like a template literal? Um, no. Or will we just put the name of the variable there? Yeah, you just go straight to the variable. The only time that you have to do the special a template literal syntax is if you're putting it into a string. Um, but this is just calculations, so behind the scenes. So we're just, just doing some stuff. So what would the variable be if we're going to get it from this array? Broken windows. Mm -hmm. And then what? Plus equals. Um, no, we're actually or, not done with this one just yet because we're not going to multiply times the entire array. We're going to multiply times a specific element from the array, right? So just like we did um, up here where we went to get a specific house name, we're gonna use that same uh -huh. bracket notation. Um, and we're gonna make sure that it's at index I because this is a loop. And every time it'll go get a different value from that window that corresponds to those houses. Um, so yeah, and then from there, you don't have to say, you don't wanna say equals again. The program will actually not know what to do if you have another equal sign at this point. So um, you just wanna keep adding um, things if we wanna do all three of these at once, right? So then the second one, um, you know, at this point we got creaky floorboards and spider webs, right? And we know that it's uh, two points for creaky floorboards, one point for spider web. So let's just follow this um, exact same thing and just do two times creaky floorboards uh, at index i. And then here it's just one times. So we don't really have to do the one times. We can just say spider webs index i. We'll just go get whatever that number is. And that's it, okay? So we've got our points, we started at zero, and now we're gonna add up three times that number, two times that number, and then that number. Um, and we already have three of our categories taken care of. So let's just go back and um, revisit this because I meant to point this out really, really um, specifically. You know, everything we're doing now, this is all really parallel. So we're going there, 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 there. <laughs> um, we're, and anytime you have index zero, you're going to be working with numbers from uh, that house and you'll keep moving through. And so having all of these arrays be exactly the same length and having the data in the same order as the house uh, it, it belongs to is really important. Um, and once you know that that's the case, you can count on that. And that's what makes it so easy to do this, where you can just write a few lines of code and put it in a loop and it's going to handle everything for all of those numbers and booleans. Okay, so uh, we're gonna continue on. So now we have um, points and we wanna, we wanna add some more points, um, but we have Boolean properties. So what do we use when we have this, uh, this true false situation? If else. Yeah, we wanna do an if else um, thing here, right? Um, and actually, this is another situation where we, we aren't going to need an, uh, an else because um, we only need to add something if it is true. And if it's not true, we just ignore it, right? So what's, um, what's our condition here? The first one we're working with, we got two of these, right? And the first one we're working with is creepy basement. So how, how would I write that? Basement. Mm -hmm. Equal. Equal. True. Um, we could do we could do that. Yes. Um, don't forget that we're not looking at the whole array. We're looking at a specific element, right? 
So we have to make use of our iterator again. So I. We the I index. Yep. Yeah, it's it's really easy. I think um, like I remember when I was learning all this for the first time and it took me a while to constantly like to actually like naturally think in terms of am I looking at the whole array or am I looking at a specific element. Um, but if you ask yourself that question every time you're trying to decide how to write this um, that will help you make sure that you're drilling down to the data where it belongs. And in this case, yeah, we definitely can't stop at just the array. We're looking at a specific element of the array. We want we want just the value for this particular house that we're on. Um, and we could do true. Um, we could say if it's equal to true, right? Um, another way to write this um, would actually be or creepy basement i. Oops, at i. Okay, just that because this already evaluates to true or false, right? And so it's you'll you'll see that sometimes and i'll tell you it's a real skill learning how to read other people's code um, because you know different people have different conventions sometimes for how they do things so if you ever come across something and it just looks like this um and and if you can go and say oh well that's because that's a boolean value then you know that that is the conditional um and you don't actually need to specify that it equals true but either one will work the code accepts it either way Okay, so if it's true, then we're going to add points, right? And we can just do the same thing here. And in this case, it just pretty much said, you know, there's no multiplication, right? It just said, if there's a creepy basement, add 25 points, right? So this one's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, and then I also need to do the same thing now for the spooky attic. Um, I mentioned before that we don't use uh, else here or if else. And the reason for that is because these are two completely different, like they're independent of one another, right? Um, they don't, it's not an either or situation. So what we're gonna do is just reuse this code. Um, and in this case, I'll use the shorthand just to show the alternative. Um, and, and same thing, it's also worth 25 points. So it'll it'll hit this one, and if it's true, it'll add the 25 points. And then it'll go and it'll check this one, and if it's true, it'll add 25. So if you've got a house in which neither of those are true, it's not gonna add you know uh, 25 or 50 points. If you've got a house in which um, only one of them is true, you'll only get 25 points. And if you've got a house in which both of them are true, you'll get the full 50 points. Does that make sense? because it's just, it's, it's just doing them completely separately. Okay. Um, and then the last thing we now have, um, oh wait, nope. Store total points. We can't store total points because we have not done the ghosts yet. Yeah, we've got our, our data that we pulled on the ghost sightings. And on that one, they told us just 10 points for every sighting, right? So this is actually going to, um, if we wanted to really, we could just go up and add it in here, couldn't we? Because it's just another multiplication problem. So why don't we do that? Um, why don't we just add that in and say ghost sightings at index i, and we'll multiply that by 10. Everybody follow that? Um, because it's it's really the same type of calculation um, where we just have a number and we want to multiply it by a certain number of points depending on how many there are. So we've accounted now for all of our different um, criteria. And so yeah, so now we're ready to store the total points. Um, once again, we established uh, an empty array here, totals. And so all we have to do while we're still inside this loop and haven't looped back around yet is to take totals and use push again. And we're gonna just push points, right? And now that total number of points will be in the totals array for that house. Um, and it should be at the right index because it's uh, you know everything that we got from index I. Um, so if we do that on every loop, and then when, you know, up here, we're resetting it back to zero. 
uh, we should get the correct totals for each one. So what I'm going to do is similar to the, what I did before, I'm going to temporarily console log this totals array um, just so that we temporary just so that we can see uh, kind of where we are with uh, collecting all this information. Okay, so we're gonna run it again. Let me get my console back. All right, so let's say we've done uh, 14, eight, 12, and nine. All right, <clears throat> so we can see now that it's done the math and um, we've got you know, four different scores and they correspond to the four different houses. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And we're just keeping up with this um, same structure of having arrays that are parallel to one another. Each one has its data from left to right um, from houses one to four, um, which is index zero to three. <laughs> All right, so we're doing good. Um, we are at the last section now. All we have to do is create this report. And this is where we can talk. Um, oh, ha, actually had this as an instruction. Okay. That's what happens when I update my code. Okay. Um, and now I'll log it out now that we've checked it and because that was just the means to an end. Okay, now the one wing to rule them all. <laughs> which I thought was really funny when I wrote this at like two in the morning last, last fall because <laughs> I was getting pretty loopy. Okay, uh, we are ready to find out which house is the most haunted. Um, oh, oh, my bad. Okay, yeah. So we can't print the report until we actually um, evaluate which one's the highest. Um, so we have one more loop to do here. And by the way, guys, just so you're not freaking out if you have not even started on part uh, three, um, the, I intentionally often make these examples a little more complex and a little more involved than what you actually need for the assignment, just to have a chance to drive some extra things home. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, multiple, uh, multiple loops, multiple types of things. And obviously I'm not going to write an exercise that mimics the assignment directly. Um, so, you know, what this is intended to do is just kind of give you a bunch of things solidify those concepts for you and then you can go and apply apply them as they actually you know uh, are needed for the assignment itself okay enough about that so establish available same pattern we've got an array we know we're going to need to um, have some information and we want to be able to store the highest score as we're going through and checking them against one another right so we'll just start by um, saying let score equal zero, similar to the way we did points. Um, and actually let's be more specific, right? Because this is not just any old score, it's the highest score. And that's important because you wanna remember what it is that you are um, actually tracking. Uh, there's no value in, st in storing it in this variable unless it is actually the highest. Okay, we're gonna loop through. So once again, we've got our typical for loop. And um, we have four houses. We can do it like we did before if we want, houses.length. We actually can do totals.length if we want because that's the um, specific array that we are uh, looping through, but it really doesn't matter since they're all the same for this particular exercise. Okay. All right. So um, I, did not read my instructions very well, did I? This says initialize to the score at index zero. And I, initial, I initialize it to zero, which is also fine, but it wasn't the instructions and I should have read my own instructions better. So what we actually wanna do is take our array of ratings totals and look at index zero and you might at first think, well, why would you do that? Because you haven't checked yet, right? But if you think about it, you're checking each of your values against one another and you've got to start somewhere. And it's possible that the very first house has the highest score, it may or may not, but your code should work either way, right? So you can always just start with your very, you know, your initial one. And 
then we can actually go and write some code that checks. Um, now, when we're on index zero, obviously it's going to check uh, itself against itself, but that's okay because the code will work every single time and that's what's important. Um, so simple uh, conditional, this is very straightforward. All we're doing is to check and see if the score we're looking at right now as we're looping through is um, greater than the highest that we've recorded so far. Does that make sense? And um, I believe you guys have done uh, stuff like this before. Yeah, you guys had that crazy thing with all the fuel, the fuel levels and the, um, what was it? Yeah, the generator fuel, and I don't remember what the other one was, but yeah. Um, so you have to compare it and just see, and then we're gonna keep going. Okay, so if that is true, then what do we need to do? Council.log? No, we don't need to print anything at this point. Um, okay. We're going to wait. At this point, we're just going to wait to print that invitation at the end. We're, we're just checking to see what the highest score is. So if we get to the point that we're checking something in that total array and it's, it's actually bigger than highest score, what do we want to do then? Because the, the, the goal of this loop is just to determine what the highest score is overall. Oh, we have to add it in the highest score array? Like... Well, hi highest score is, um, is not an array, actually. This, I'm going to put a note here. This represents um, a, a number. Because you remember, the total of the array, you, you went and you just looked at the very first one. and. I don't know if it's still here. Yeah. So our array, um, when we did this, the last answers, the first one was 218. So right now, highest score is storing 218. And when it gets to, um, you know, when, it, when it's checking against itself, obviously nothing's going to happen. But let's say we go to, um, you know, I equals one. Now we're looking at this one, right? So totals um, at index I is now 181. So we're saying if, 181 is greater than highest score, then we would do something. In this case, that actually is false. So we're just going to move on um, and skip it. We're not going to do anything. So let's go to the next one, i equals 2. So now we come up um, that totals at index i is 219, right? It is greater than highest score. So what do we need to do to make sure we are keeping track of the highest score? Are we saving the totals index as the highest score where we found? Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, this is a very common thing in coding. You're, you run across stuff like this all the time. So um, you'll get used to this, but yeah. Uh, in this case, the whole point of this whole check is to see if you need to update this with a new number. So that's what, exactly what we're gonna do. If this number is now the reigning champion of highest scores, then we need to actually save it as the highest score. So it's that straightforward, right? Um, but we only do that if this is true. And otherwise, it's just going to keep looking, keep checking. So then we get to i equals 3, the very last one. It checks and it says if you know 137 is greater than what, what is now 219, then we would update it again. But it's not. So when we get down here, let's just put um, a, a temporary little thing in here and say, um, you know, uh, the highest score is, and then we'll do a little template literal thing here and say highest score, just to make sure that we've updated it and the value is what we're expecting. Um, oops, the pinky's not working. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Let's, uh, I'm gonna, did I, I think, yeah, I already console logged it out, okay. All right, so we'll do this again. 13, eight, six, 12. All right, 
And it's telling us that the highest score is 208. And of course, I probably should have un, uh, uncommented this so that we could see um, it all together. Let's do this again. Oops, I was about to, to... Okay, there we go. Yeah, so it started with 198 and started checking. And then when it got to index two here, it found one that was higher and it updated it. And we can see now that it correctly stores the highest one. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so now for really for real, we are ready to do this report. <laughs> All right, let me, um, I'm gonna comment those back out, temporary stuff. All right, um, the last thing, in, in order to do this, uh, this message, we need to know what the index is of that highest score. Um, so I've mentioned here that you could consider using the index of method. And uh, so that is, we're gonna be using this index throughout everything. So let's, let's do that real fast. Um, let, let's, uh, we'll call it winner index. How's that? Sure, okay. Um, so what we wanna do, the thing that we are basing it on is this highest score, right? That's what we actually wanna go look for. Um, and, and we're gonna be looking for it where? In the totals array, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna go over to the totals array and we wanna say, I wanna find what index it was that you found um, that, that highest number in the last loop. And we will literally just use that highest score. So that's the value it's going to look at in all of the elements. And um, one, of the, one of the things to know about index of is it always returns the first instance of. Um, so the only way that this actually would like possibly be problematic in this scenario is if you had two houses that ended up with the same score. It would just make the first one the winner. Um, and that's okay because uh, you know for what we're doing for this exercise, that's all right. Um, but just keep that in mind. This goes and finds um, the first instance of a value in case you have two that are the same. Um, so we, we're gonna go find that and then uh, it's going to save that index as a number. And obviously it's going to be you know, either one, zero, one, two, or three. Um, because uh, we know for sure that every single one of our arrays with all of our data has exactly four elements and they correspond exactly to each house. So that's why this is important, right? We need to know where that score was in this array so that we know where all the information is that we're going to draw from in all of the other arrays. You have any questions about that? This is how we'll know. Um, and I actually think, yeah, we'll go with it. All right, um, so I've got a little note here. You may have picked up on the fact that we could have tracked which rating was the highest during the original loop instead of having two loops. And by original, of course, I mean the, the scoring loop, not not the um, not the one we added in at the beginning for the user input. Um, it's true, and that would be efficient. Um, but I wanted to handle it separately because you guys are new at this, and I thought it would be helpful maybe just to think through uh, the loop that calculates all the points um, a little bit separately from the loop that evaluates all of them. <coughs> but it could have been done at the same time. All right message for really, for real, for real, for real, promise. Um, let's go look at this file again. We've got, um, we've got, you know, some text going on. It looks like we'll be able to, you know, kind of copy and paste it over. Here's the thing about this. Um, you might look at this and just kind of go, you know, holy crap, that's a lot of console log statements, right? Because um, you've got a lot of stuff going on. But 
there are ways to break down um, all your text that you're wanting to print um, and kind of piece it together in a way that makes for you know slightly cleaner code. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to identify that. I think I think we should probably just treat this whole block right here, and we'll we'll just call it the header. Um, and then uh, this one is one of the paragraphs that has variables in it, right? These numbers will be determined by going and grabbing data from the, all of those arrays um, at, the, at the final index of the high score. And this one is the one that has these phrases that may or may not actually even be in here, depending on whether the, the, the winning house had a creepy basement or a, um, a spooky, I think we said spooky attic. Um, and then this last stuff down here, these two paragraphs, they are, um, you know, they don't have any special data in them. We just got to tag them on and make sure they're formatted right. So let's go do that. Let's start with this one. I'm just going to copy it from here. And yeah, all right. So um, let's start by. Uh, just um, let's see. I'm going to use regular quotes because there's no need to have a, a template literal for this. Um, oh, for the love. Okay. Um, now this is looking a little funny, and it's because of the stars. Okay. Let me think about this. Um, it's because I pasted it in, but it's not. Okay. We're going to use the um, escape uh, character backslash in a whole lot. And that's going to help us. I, you know what? I'm going to change it back because I think it doesn't know what to do with all the asterisks because of the way, um, because of the way comments work. Okay. Um, so what I've done here basically is put the whole thing in the in the back ticks, and then just put a couple of new line characters right at the end of this. But now I'm realizing um, if I have a space after this that might end up looking a little funny yeah see there's a space there so maybe a better way to treat it would be uh to put it right at the front end of the one i want to be on the next line so let's do that instead and then um at the end here we actually want our, our uh, we, we want to have a couple of spaces right so we're going to put two of them because if you look at this we not only need to go um down from here we also need to you know, have one more so we have a, a full line. Um, and the only reason I need to take this approach is because I'm not console logging this separately, which would automatically add an extra line. Um, you can experiment with this um, because it's some of what I'm saying might be con sound confusing. Um, you, know, you can experiment with like, you know, just console logging the header and then just console logging the rest and then you'll end up with an extra row. But if, you're, if we're gonna build this as one big long string, um, then, oh boy, here we go. Um, then we need to make sure we're accounting for that as if it's all one string. Does that make sense? I think probably if you guys are working on your functions exercises and working on your shapes, your triangles and diamonds, you're finding this out right now, <laughs> that it matters um, how you treat uh, your strings and where you, where you put your breaks in. Okay, so now we're ready for the next section. So let's do, um, let's just call it P1 for paragraph one. Um, you know what, I'm changing my mind. I just want it to be clear. It is actually bad practice to have abbreviations like that that don't mean anything to anybody but you because other people will eventually come along and read your code and they need to know what it represents. So bad carry, I have corrected my, my terrible decision, okay. Um, and this time, same thing, we're going to use um, back ticks because we need to do uh, some template literal stuff here. Some things. I just realized somebody's got something in the chat here. Nope, looks like everything's okay. It's, it's not easy uh, when you're presenting to keep track of the chat. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, no harm. All right, let's go back to this file and get the next paragraph. We'll just grab it, bring it back over here, paste it in between the back ticks, and we're good. But we have some data that we don't want to actually be hard coded. We want to uh, represent. So, what am I going to put here uh, instead of the name? Uh, 
probably like a template literal function. Um, well, I, I don't know what the name of it, but the dollar sign with the uh, curvy brackets and then the name of the uh, house you want in there. Right, it, yeah, and that, um, it's actually called a placeholder, which is a, a, a term I like because it makes perfect sense. You have a sentence mm -hmm. and you're putting something in as a placeholder um, for the word you actually want to be there. Cool. Okay. And just like um, we did before uh, when we were getting the user input, how do we reference the house name? What's the syntax? We can go back and up, up and look at these um, arrays to get the names of the arrays if you want. Houses? Yeah. Yep. Oh, my power is fluctuating. Um, houses. And what about houses? I, the bracket, and the I. Okay, good thinking because uh, you're right that we need to use a variable here. Um, however, we are in a different circumstance than we were before because before we were inside loops, right? And uh -huh. um, you remember when I was talking about variable scope, the reason that for all three of our loops, we were able to use I over and over again and use let with it is because it doesn't exist outside the for loop. So anything in here can be, you know, so you can, you can totally just keep using I as long as it's not a loop within a loop. Um, that's when you would have to use something different. So I works because that's the variable we have have as the iterator for the for loop um, because we're looking at several different houses. But in this case, we want a very specific house and that is why we did what we did right here because we needed to go find out what that index is that we can use every time. So instead of I, what am I gonna use? Usual. Zero. Uh, no, because we, we don't know what the, we don't know what the index is. It's going to depend on the values and the calculations. So Winter index. Yeah, yeah. This is the so we're going to use this variable because it represents the correct index of the of the house with the highest score. And it'll work on every single one of the arrays that we're going to be referencing because everything's always in the same order in each array. Okay, so yeah, winner index exactly. That way it does not matter which house won, um, it, will, it will pull the correct data. Um, so we'll have the correct name here. So then we're gonna do the same thing and I'm just gonna copy this. So let's just change this to broken windows. Oh, uh -oh. And this to creaky floorboards. Everybody following me on this? We're just going to each array and, uh, and getting the data from the same index in each array. Oops, spider webs, there we go. And ghost sightings, there we go. Okay, so we've accounted for all of the things that had individual numbers. Um, and that, that concludes paragraph two, okay. Um, we already took care of the spacing ahead of this paragraph with these two uh, new lines. So uh, let's do the same thing here to put in the spacing um, for the next one. And paragraph two, and this is, let's actually, um, I'm gonna start out with that, let's take a look at it. Um, this is the one that's that's got a little bit of extra work because we've got to put a conditional in, right? All right. So we can just go ahead and put this here, but we need to break it up because we're not sure, depending on how things turn out, whether we want that phrase or this phrase to be in there. So let's start out with just, see, includes. Okay, we're gonna start out by actually ending it there. Um, so, so we're basically gonna take the first part of the paragraph and set, you know, store that in the paragraph two variable, and then we'll build it, right? 
um, we'll keep adding. So let's do a conditional and say if, and this is where we need to go back to our arrays, um, make sure we're, we're referencing the right one. Um, so if cre creepy basement or if spoo spooky attic, because we'll do that one too. Um, creepy basement. And, and again, we're not looking at just the array. We have to look at the one that's for that, um, for the winter house, right? So we're going to go look and see if this is true for this house specifically. And if it is, we will build paragraph two by adding do the plus equals and add Let's see, I gotta think about this. We got, we got commas here. And so we have to be careful about um, what we put where. We'll, we'll see how it turns out in a second. All right. And then we can do the same thing on the next part, except it's gonna be spooky attic. And we're gonna add a different phrase here. Okay. Yeah, I think this is going to work. And then, and then after that, you just say that you want to take paragraph two and tack on a little bit more. And we'll pull this back to there. Okay, and you can't really tell because of, um, let me pull this back. Let me see if it's easier to read this now. Yeah, so you notice um, that I decided to put the spaces here, here, and here, and keep these um, commas tied to the phrases that are optional, so that if um, these both were to return false, then it would just read the, you know, the tour of the main house is 20 minutes long and includes a frightful turn in the rear, rear garden. It would just skip over it entirely. Um, but yeah, 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 it'll work. Sorry, I was thinking it through. Sorry for the radio silence. <laughs> okay. Um, and you know, this is another one of those things where you can just kind of experiment, you know, um, and you know, keep printing it to the console until it looks the way you want it to. We know that we probably are already going to want this because we're about to do the final paragraph or final two paragraphs, I should say. Okay, um, let's close that out with a semicolon, and then we'll just do the last part. And we're going to say three and four. Let's just do it all at once. Um, and just to show that it doesn't matter, this really is just straight text, uh, no variables, no need to have um, any kind of template literal. So I'm just gonna use regular quotes and it will be able to concatenate it all together, no problem. Okay, so we did, oh, here we go. That's what I'm looking for. We just need to get this text. So we're going to grab these and take them back and paste it in. And I need to back this up so that it understands that it's still part of the same string. But what we would do there is that's where we put our other double um, new lines so that it'll force this down um, with a space to the last paragraph. Uh, okay, so we need to we need to test it. Um, and see if this thing is running the way we're expecting it to. Okay. How many ghosts at Netherfield Manor? Let's say 13, seven, uh, 11. It's, it's hanging up on me again. There we go. Okay, now this is interesting. Oh, <laughs> now that's very interesting. How, what did I do? I set up all of these um, things, but I didn't actually print any of them. 
Okay, it's because I did not use let here. And uh, also because I didn't actually console log anything here. So I, I failed to put it all together, which is kind of the most important part, right? Um, we've established a header, paragraph one, paragraph two, and paragraphs three and four. So let's actually do the proper console log statement. Sorry about that. I was shooting right ahead, wasn't I? Um, and because I have built this string so that the new lines will handle the breaks, I can just concatenate all of the strings together. Just like this paragraph two, which will contain only what we want it to contain. And then paragraphs three and four. Um, and technically that's not camel case, but shh, I won't tell if you don't. Um, all right, now let's run it. All right, let's clear and then run it again. All right, um, uh, okay, 12, making it up as I go along. Okay, so it looks like um, Netherfield Manor won this time. At two broken windows, three, uh, Creaky floorboards, 41 spider webs, 12 ghost sightings. Um, and then here, when it talks about the tour of the main house, it says it includes a harrowing ordeal in the creepy basement, but it does not mention the, uh, the attic, right? And it reads fine. So it looks like our, our little uh, conditionals there actually worked. Um, you definitely do not have to do this whole conditional thing for your uh, graded assignment. Um, well, the way that I did it where you're like, Piecing, to, piecing it together the way that I did. That, but I thought it was worthwhile showing that you can be really creative with how you piece um, things together uh, when you're working with data. And yeah, and if we go back and we look, um, two broken windows, three, four, it's 41. Sp so, you know, we, we got exactly the values that we were expecting to get um, because they all came out of index zero, um, which apparently was the winner, winner index. Um, true and false there. And then of course the ghost settings that we used. Okay, so if we were to run this again, um, we'll just do completely different. Uh, oops, <laughs> I put in a number it's not gonna like. Yep. Um, all right, now Thackeray Park win, uh, one. This is um, the one at index two. So, um, we got three, you know, three windows, seven floorboards, 31 spider webs. So yeah, so it's putting in exactly the data that belongs to that house too. And in this case, there's no, um, there's no uh, basement, but there is an attic mentioned in the description here, right? Um, so you've got, uh, I think you've got a working program here. Does anybody have any questions about everything? Just, I know I talked through it all pretty much myself. Um, so, so tell me if you've got questions about everything I just said. Does anybody have any questions in general? I have a general question. Yeah. So for the graded assignment, when we do the totals, we have to put the, uh, the problem in a for loop to get the percentage, because you know how it says the number of correct answers times the questions, or questions times the number of correct answers. Yeah, let me um, go pull up the instructions so we can look at that together. All right, um, assignments. All right, so part three. Iterate to ask all of the questions. Yeah. Calculate the candidate score and print the results. Okay. Um, so yeah, so they've they've given you the equation to use. And it looks like, I mean, the way I'm reading this, it looks like you have to have already determined how many correct answers there were um, before you can do this calculation. So 
there's a number of different ways to do that um, as you're going through and asking and, and getting their responses back. Um, to say any more than that right now would probably be too much. I've got to be careful because, you know, these these assignments, the value of these things, um, and the reason that they're you know more difficult is because this is your chance to show launch code that you've been you know learning what they've been teaching you. Um, because the you know the most important thing that launch code is about it's not just the education. They're actually really about getting you into a new career if that's your goal. So which is you know almost almost everybody, that's what they're headed for. So um, we want to absolutely make sure that you really know what you're doing um, before we you know, go and shop you out to <laughs> all these uh, companies to try to get you an apprenticeship um, later on. So uh, I think that um, if you, you know, definitely, if, you're, if you think that through, um, you know, what, what needs to happen inside a loop and what doesn't, um, and if you think that through and you're still stuck, just uh, message me privately and I'll uh, see if I can help you. But basically that's the deal, you know, with loops, you, you just have to kind of think, you have to think through what data do I have now and what don't I have? How am I gonna, you know, figure that out? Um, if it's something that you need to loop through so that you can get data for every single thing that you're, you know, uh, looking at, um, then obviously that has to happen inside the loop. But if you've got data that uh, you can't actually do anything until you have it, but you depend on the, the loop to finish all the way through to get it to you, then that's stuff that you would, you know, code that you would have after the loop. Um, I, I think it, uh, one of the TAs mentioned in, in lecture earlier this week uh, that, uh, you know, code runs from top to bottom in JavaScript, right? So you just want to have things in the right order. Um, so that you, you have the data that you need when you need it, if that makes sense. Is that what you were getting at? Just to make sure I'm actually <laughs> speaking to the question you asked. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> if we don't, if you don't have any more questions, um, I think that we can uh, close this one out. Um, I, uh, I think that I know that this, uh, you know, thanks for hanging in here. It's been a, you know, a good hour and a half working through this, but um, I wanted to be thorough. I want to make sure that you guys have a little bit of practice here and some explanations on all the different new concepts, because it's a, I said this at the beginning, I think it's a little overwhelming putting it all together for the first time to have to think about a whole program that has a whole bunch of different sections that all depend on each other and how to do everything in the right sequence. Um, and I think that um, while obviously there's a lot of ways in which this does not translate directly to your graded assignment, it hopefully helps you um, with, with the process of thinking through um, all the logic behind that. Does that make sense? So um, let me know if, uh, you know, Slack me if you have any other questions um, as you're working on this. I'm going to, because I updated this, I actually need to go back and update my REPLs to have the user input um, stuff, but which won't take me terribly long. I'll probably finish it before the, the recording is, is finished processing, but I'll get it all in my Google Doc um, tonight. Let me make sure you have the link to this. If you've not seen this before, this is where all my, pro my <clears throat> excuse me, uh, exercises, practice exercises. I've got a bunch of new documents up in the front here just to help you kind of get oriented to lots of coding things. Um, and then of course the graded assignment preps are the ones down here at the end. And look at this, we're gonna be able to replace this, yay. Um, and uh, you'll have uh, access to this any old time and can work on um, these things. And you know this will take you all the way through the end of unit one. So let me put that in the Zoom. That's not what I was looking for. Oh, it's because I'm still presenting. Okay, let me put this in the chat. This, um, there you go. Um, and you guys can, uh, you know, bookmark this or whatever and come back to it as often as you want to. Um, and I will be adding things to it um, soon too. I've got a few things in my list where I want to write some new exercises to fill some gaps. Um, so 
expect more to be coming.